Okay, well, welcome to the July 2021 Planetarian Zoom seminar. Um, today, we have John Erickson from the Lawrence Hall of Science. He's going to be talking about tips for making videos for virtual planetarium experiences. And uh, he told me that you can ask a question at any time. Just make sure you unmute, stay muted uh, when you're not asking a question, but unmute if you want to ask a question. Uh, and I'll say uh, again, I may announce it one more time. Uh, if you haven't signed in on the chat, do sign in with your name and where you're from. Okay. All right, John, take it away. All right. Um, so I've been for a year and a half making short videos and posting them on YouTube on behalf of our planetarium at the Lawrence Hall of Science. And I know a lot of you have done the same. Um, and I don't have a gallery view, and maybe you don't either, so um, I won't ask for hands right now, but I'll just say, if you are one of the people who have been doing videos, um, feel free to chip in with um, questions, suggestions, alternatives, whatever will help people who are interested in this kind of process. Uh, when we shut down, someone at Lawrence Hall said, well, let's do something online. We'll call it the Lawrence at Home. The Lawrence at Home. And I said, yeah, I can do a couple videos a week. So at first, I did a couple videos a week, every week. Um, got to be a lot of video making, so it went down to one a week. Now I generally do it twice a month. Um, once I do... Um, highlights for the month. So I'll be posting an August one pretty soon. Um, uh, we used to have on our website, the Space Telescope Institute's Tonight Sky videos, which are about five minutes. They're very dreamy and slow and they show deep sky objects that you're not going to see. So um, we're replacing those with ones that are more tailored learned to our geographical area and um, more practical for the casual stargazer. Um, and then each month I usually sneak in a special topic, um, a particular constellation and how to find it or a news event, um, whatever I think might be interesting for that month. They're usually three to 10 minutes. And I should tell you that I like the shorter ones better. They seem to be nicer. Uh, sometimes it takes longer to make a shorter one. That's sort of a cliche, but it's true. Um, but it's a good amount of time for a concept. Uh, it matches the YouTube attention span. Um, I want people to see one and say, hey, I wonder what's on that video again, and not feel like they're committing to a 20 or 30 minute experience that they're going to watch for three to 10 minutes and be glad that they did. And also, given the amount of time I'm able to work on these three to 10 minutes is a practical length. I'm just wondering from some of you who make videos how long they are and what your satisfaction with the length is and why you chose it. Um, and if no one speaks up, I'll just move on. But is there anyone who wants to comment on that now? Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in. Um, this is Tony at the Bishop Museum Planetarium in Honolulu. Um, when the, I only did a couple of videos kind of early on and then um, I sort of fell out of doing them. But <clears throat> five minutes or so seemed to be pretty good which I kind of found challenging because I, I had written up my script and then went to read it and it was like, you know, 10 minutes long or something like that. And then um, it was ended up being a lot longer than what I thought it was going to be for what I wanted to include. So <clears throat> having to like cut that back a lot. Um, but I also wanted to keep them shorter for the um, production reasons too and not spend so much time doing that. Um, and attention span we found too. Um, was there another person? Yes, um, mine are targeted at five minutes and at 
five minutes, I often can't email them. Four minutes is, uh, is short enough with uh, OBS to email, but five or six minutes, I have to FTP them. And that becomes a, a hassle because we post them on, my, on our Facebook page each week, not just YouTube. Uh huh. Yeah, I post them to YouTube directly to my home, so that not a problem for me. But I can see how it would affect you. Um, was there anyone else? Hey, hi. This is Ron Palumbo. I'm with the Hudson River Museum in Yonkers. We have a planetarium, and during the pandemic, we did a couple of. Uh, videos like that and targeting three to five minutes. And I found that to be a great length because when you're looking for visuals to add to it, <laughs> you can kind of really cull it down and not have to have people staring at a screen for a minute and a half with nothing where the image doesn't change. You know, I don't do anything on camera. I did everything where there were images on, you know, on the screen during the course of the video. And then eventually we went to a live planetarium you know, thing using you know, Stellarium and Celestia. Uh, that was like a, you know, a half hour or, or an hour long show. But th at first we started with the videos and totally agree, shorter is better. It also makes you focus better too, just in terms of getting the points across quicker. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, here is my studio. This is my daughter's bedroom and um, this is looking forward. Here's the professional lighting, which is a window with a sheer curtain in front of it. Um, my laptop is here. Um, and I have an auxiliary monitor next to it. Um, we've got Zoom open here. And if you wonder, why am I in such a strange posture? I've got my iPhone and I'm taking a picture of this. Um, if you look around the back, it's just a green piece of fabric hanging on a clothesline. Um, so this little screen, Zoom people know you can choose your background. And this is my selection of Zoom backgrounds. All my visuals I use as Zoom backgrounds. Um, and then there's a little preview screen on here. And my camera is here. My camera is right there. So if I want to address my audience, I look at my camera and I can see myself on the little screen there. But when I'm demonstrating something, I look at my monitor as I'm doing now. So looking here, looking here. Now in this meeting, um, I've got you all arrayed at the top of my extra monitor. So if I'm looking at you and considering what you're saying, it looks like I'm looking off into space somewhere. Um, that's something you can live with in this media, in this meeting, and it doesn't affect recording, of course. Um, it's a simple setup. Any questions about it? All right. I have a quick question, John. It took me a while sure. to unmute. Um, are you, you're not using OBS at all then to do this? No, or? I'm not. Okay. Um, so here's the process. Um, come up with an idea. Um, gather and create visuals. And I agree with the person who spoke before. I forget the name. It's not on my screen. Uh, but you need enough so that you can switch every half minute or so. Except I don't mind dwelling on one if it's really juicy and we can dig into it. Um, then I have to think of the narrative and the sequence of visuals that will fit the narrative. I once or twice tried writing a script for it. Um, reading the script while I'm doing that thing just didn't work for me. So now I figure if I know what I'm going to say, I just say it. And if it doesn't come out right, well, it's a pre-recorded thing. I say it again and say it till I get it right. And then uh, edit whatever I want. So I record it on Zoom. Um, and then I just edit in quick time. Now this is really simple and I can't figure out whether it's because I'm being very efficient or kind of lazy, but I use just Zoom and QuickTime. In QuickTime you can 
cut out segments and then you can order them and tack them together to make a full video. So I don't do any post-production adding visuals over tops of things or titles or sound. Um, it's all planned ahead of time in Zoom backgrounds. And I'm doing this meeting pretty much the same way I do the videos, except this is live and I don't get to edit it. Um, after editing, maybe I record some pieces again because I've said something silly like, when the sun's going around the earth, and I don't catch that until I listen to it on the video, or sometimes I press, I don't press record again when I'm uh, starting a new thing, I just start talking. And then when I'm editing, there's a piece missing. Um, so maybe I record and edit some more. And then I post it on YouTube. And from start to finish, four to six hours is about normal. Um, all of my sky views, or almost all of my sky views, are from Stellarium. And I always say, we're using Stellarium, the computer program, to visualize the sky here so that Stellarium gets some credit. Um, and how I used to do it was I get a full screen Stellarium and take a screenshot of what I wanted and then just post that as a Zoom background. Um, and when I wanted to show the time and date, I'd use the Stellarium time and date box and say, here it is, uh, 7, that's July 30th, 2130. This is a 24 hour clock. It means 930 in the evening. That's the way I used to do it. Um, nowadays, I usually take a piece of a full screen Stellarium view and enlarge it. And that way I don't get, let's see, see if I go back. Um, Stellarium's got these little tools for you to simulate a telescope up here. And it's got all of these things down here. Sometimes I'd edit those out, sometimes I didn't. But if I just um, cut out a middle of the screen, I don't have to do that. I think it looks better if I just add text in Photoshop to my screenshot of what time it is. I don't have to explain it's a 24 hour clock and I can say about 9.30 and there's no little Julian calendar tab that people have to scratch their heads about. Um, also, when I do it this way, the stars look a little larger and the labels on the stars look a little bigger. I know you can go into the settings of Stellarium and control those things. Um, and I've actually made the stars about one and a half times the default size of Stellarium. So they'll show up in a video a little better. Um, I'm pretty happy with the label size because I'm reading it out loud to the audience anyway. Um, uh, John, oh, question. Yeah. Um, the uh, the uh, well, I remember when I saw your early ones. Uh, it was it was uh, really hard to see the star, you know, the constellations and things. And it makes it much easier. I, I, I discovered that when I made it full screen, you know, I, a lot of times I have Zoom as a small window, but um, if I made it a full screen, it made it show up really better. Um, have you, I mean, would it be good to let the viewers know that it's best if you show the video full screen? Um, that sounds like a nice idea. Hello, if you want to see this picture better, do full screen on your device. The poor phone users won't have a huge advantage there, but other people might. Um, what do other people think about that? Do other people do that is another question. Yeah, that's, that is an issue with Stellarium with, uh, you know, when we're doing the live shows with Stellarium because the, uh, the, 
you know, you had to make the stars bigger than you would really like to. And uh, it kind of was very deceptive to, for people. So when I, when I was doing the pre-recorded videos, I was taking screenshots and, and either enhancing or, you know, just doing trial and error to get the stars to the right sizes where they didn't look hokey and like just, you know, white blobs. So, uh, but I definitely agree that you have to tell them to do full screen because uh, this is, that's the best experience for the, uh, for Stellarium. Mm -hmm. um, one little trick I do occasionally is if I've been showing the evening sky, looking west, for instance, here I was doing a video about seeing the summer triangle in the evening and the morning on the same day. Um, looking west in the evening, I was on one side. And just to let them know, new point of view, I switched my whole apparatus and put myself on the other side. I thought that was a useful little trick. Um, usually I try to make it realistic for my local star watchers in the Bay Area. We've got an urban center. Here in Philadelphia, it's a lot worse. Uh, you can see only the brightest stars. So if I'm trying to be practical about showing people what they're going to see, I use filter out the dimmer stars leave only the brighter ones. Um, have to say things like, once I've explained the summer triangle, this is squeezed down to your computer screen in the real sky. Please look for something much bigger. Um, oh, here's Jupiter and Saturn. Jupiter is as bright as any star, brighter than most. Um, Saturn here looks almost as bright as Jupiter. When you see it in the real sky, actually it won't be. So acknowledging that the computer simulation isn't what you'll see in the sky. Um, sometimes I can't filter enough stars. Like if I want the whole Big Dipper in, there's that one star that's dimmer than the others and I want to show it. Or Leo's got one star in its sickle shape that's dimmer than the rest. Um, and usually it's a habit of mine to say, um, if you're where in, near a city like I am, you might not see that star. I guess that's something you can do in any planetarium experience. But in the planetarium, we also want to show things that they might not see. So um, be realistic, but you can be real. The Milky Way is really there. And if you want to tell people that it's there and show them that it goes through the summer triangle, um, it's nice to give them a nice rich sky view now and then. A lot of times I annotate the Stellarium view, not just by adding the date and time. Um, usually it's because I'm doing time sequences. So here is one from April where I wanted to show the moon as it um, progressed from a slim crescent and went up past Mars. Um, and I have to tell my participants watching the video that Stellarium just shows the moon as a little blob because on a computer simulation, it's not big enough to see its shape. We've enlarged it for your convenience. So you know what kind of phase to look for. This is one of my favorite ones. It took me a long time. Uh, but showing the progression of Venus and Mercury last May. Um, and this is one, I made several versions of it, mostly with more and more labels, so that we started with uh, just where Venus and Mercury started and ended in May. And then we added the label for when Mercury would be the highest, not necessarily the brightest and easiest to see, and then added a label for Mercury and Venus being next to each other on one of those days. Um, and I have to say sometimes when I construct a video like this using um, little bits of Stellarium screenshots, I learn quite a lot about how things appear to move. This sort of pointy, Mercury trajectory is interesting to me. And this Venus one, of course, is going to come up and loop over. 
as we go from May to November, is it that Venus is going to keep showing? I think it is. Um, not every visual I do is from Stellarium. Um, sometimes I make an orrery. This one I use to show the conjunction of Jupiter and Saturn. That one was my most popular video. I guess the Google search algorithms caught on to it or something. Um, but it's kind of nice because I could take a ruler and just line it up to show Earth, Jupiter, and Saturn lined up. So there's cool tricks you can do um, when you're recording in front of a camera like that and you've got a virtual background. Another cool trick I did once, um, this was during the wildfires out west when the sky was orange and the sun looked red or orange. Um, I had a diffraction grating here and you could look through it, um, but your audience doesn't see what you see. If you put it in front of the camera, then the audience will see the nice pair of spectra there. And then um, this is the same light bulb looking through a container of milky water and you can see the reddening, and you can also see how the red end of the spectra on the right and left is still pretty strong, whereas the blue end is weakened. And I was trying to think, is that something you could do in a planetarium? Um, at Lawrence Hall, where we have small planetariums, we occasionally pass out diffraction gratings. Um, but it was so handy to be able to just slap it over the camera and um, do that demonstration. Here's another background that wasn't from Stellarium. It, we were examining the new moon, I mean the full moon and why it looks so big. And this is an optical illusion that relates to one possible explanation of why the full moon looks so big when it's near the horizon, but less big when it's up away from the horizon. And you can invite the um, people watching to actually measure it on their computer screens to confirm that the two people in this scene are actually the same size, even though they look different. Just the way the moon appears to be the same size, no matter whether it's near the horizon or higher, it just doesn't appear to appear to be the same size. So here's another chance for us to talk. I want to talk about interactivity. Uh, sometimes I've said, pause this video and look for um, the Tyrannosaurus in the moon or the hook shape that comes down from the bright star. And then um, I give them a few seconds, hope they've paused it if they're really serious about looking for these things themselves, and maybe say, show it to someone you're watching with. Um, that's one of the ways I get some interactivity. Another way I get some interactivity is by asking questions and having them think and discuss with um, someone they might be watching. For instance, I was doing one about gravity. Um, this was actually in a series of different videos from my stargazing one. So there's actually no stargazing going on here, but uh, throwing the ball up and down and asking questions like, when is my hand exerting a force on the ball? And when is gravity exerting a force on the ball? Here are three choices. Do we, any of them seem correct to you? Um, talk about it with someone you're watching with. Those are the way I've attained some degree of interactivity. Um, I'd like to hear more from you all about what else can be done or has been done and how it's worked out for you. I'm removing the spotlight uh, Thank you. while we have that.
actually, I, I, I feel compelled to make a comment at this time that watching you, John, doing this presentation reminds me all the times I've watched shows that you've done at Lawrence Hall of Science and how pleasurable it is to watch those shows, uh, how you involve, well, it's usually with kids and now you just have a bunch of older kids here. Bunch of big kids. Yeah. So it's a tricky one. I think we're probably all having a hard time coming up with ideas. If there were anything happening with the audience in real time, I think I would have a lot more ideas, but the strategies that you've suggested there for them interacting with each other during the video, I think are, are great. Yeah, they're sort of the low hanging fruit and I was kind of hoping there'd be a flood of other ideas, but I'm not really surprised that there's not because it is kind of a challenge. Um, I know some people who do live things on Facebook, let them be comments. Um, I think some of us at Lawrence Hall invited people to post questions and comments and YouTube warned us off saying, you labeled it for kids, you can't collect information. Um, oh. Yeah, I think my first video, don't watch my first one, it's not as good as any of the others. Um, <laughs> I think I said, if you have something you want to see a video about, um, post it at this address. And um, that wasn't allowed. Uh. You know, there's one thing comes to mind that for something where you have a multiple choice question like that, I'm, I, I haven't quite thought this through yet, but you could have a form, a web, a web form where people could go if there was an easy way to get them <laughs> The problem here is uh, how to get them to that web, web form. Uh, but actually, that could be done with a QR code. They could do that. And then they could put their answer in that form. And then you'd have that um, for the record or maybe even be able to display it instantaneously live. I, that's just a sort of an un, <laughs> unfiltered uh, thought. Yeah, I'm thinking for the record would work the way we are doing it. Um, I'm also thinking that we'd have to take off the for kids label from the video, even to do that. Um, and when you do for kids in YouTube, then there are no comments. And um, again, I'm not sure if it's caring or laziness, but we didn't want to deal with the possibility of um, comments we didn't want our viewers to read on, on our YouTube pages. So we don't have comments. The legal stuff always gets in the way these days. Yeah. I like the idea of collecting the feedback in an online forum because then you could see if, uh, if a lot of people were selecting one of the incorrect answers, you might want to do a follow-up um, a, a more in depth on whatever part they weren't understanding the first time around. Mm -hmm. so there could be a reward for people responding. Uh, oh. You know, where it's not displayed, they don't get it. You know, it would be still for children, and it would be anonymous. But uh, maybe, well, hmm, well, like maybe it wouldn't be pass. anonymous if they could get something out of it couldn't be anonymous. Okay, I haven't thought this through yet. <laughs> John, for this, for the one in this picture with the ball in your hand, do you tell them to, to get out a ball or a marble or whatever and try it themselves? Um, gosh, in this case, I don't think I did. Because that could be an opportunity too. Uh-huh, to have them actually do something. I mean, that's not a hard, that's not a hard thing to, to find around the house. Yeah, that yeah. would be an easy one. There was one where I asked them to simulate the rotation and orbit of Mercury. Um, that one was too long and too complicated. And yeah. I wonder if anyone did it, uh, but it was fun to make. I think one thing that you could uh, do for interactivity is just like in a classroom or even in the planetarium, if you can get them to stand up and do, and do something or uh, physically do something with their hands, like 
the example, well, you, you had a good example where they were measuring, you know, the height of a, of a person with their hands or, you know, or with a ruler or whatever, whenever that, whenever you make them do something physical, that's yeah. interactivity in, intrinsically. I had one that I did a couple of months ago for a virtual field trip where I put a picture of the sun on the screen and told the kids, because this was, I was trying to uh, talk about day and night and uh, time differences. And I said, you are the earth. And so now I want you to turn your head so that it's, you know, sunrise on your nose or midnight on your right ear. And that, that was kind of fun. I think they liked that. Oh, uh, yeah. So we do that with a light bulb in the planetarium, but their computer screen is their light bulb, their reference for the direction of the sun. It's a good one. Oh, my last section is a few pitfalls. Were there anything you all had to add before I go to that? Here I go. Um, I'll stop at the end or start at the end um, with sloppy editing and proofreading. I remember telling you that once I said, as the sun goes around the earth, it does this or that. And in that case, um, I have to change it. I can't leave it. There was one case where I had a video about the new moon and I asked them, think about what new moon means to you. If you're watching with someone, talk about what the phrase new moon means to you. And then I stepped aside so that they could see the question written down. Um, but I had a typo there and it said <laughs> new moon. And it just happens that I had been holding my cat in the video. Sometimes I do that just to sort of make it homey, I'm working from home. Um, and so, um, so I left it, but I am a little embarrassed by it. <laughs> Would have been a lot more work to go back to this and edit it out and redo the whole thing. So I hope people who noticed it appreciated it. Um, another pitfall is, whoops, the moon is out. My very last video, I had seen Scorpius and followed it up to Zubin el Janubi and Zubin es Shamali, the two stars with the best names in the sky, um, which used to be visualized as part of Scorpius. It's a nice story. Um, and then I posted it and then I went out to look and there was a just past first quarter moon going through Virgo and I couldn't see anything in Libra. And so for the next week and a half, that gibbous moon was going right across where I was asking people to look for these things. So if anyone actually did what I wanted them to do and saw the video and went out that evening, um, too bad for them. Uh, so, oops, the moon is out. Um, forgotten longitude and latitude. Um, remember this one, which says half hour after sunset. I was just in England visiting family. Half hour after sunset, it's full daylight pretty much. Um, it makes a difference where you are, how you label things and what they're going to look like. Um, one time I took advantage of it, though. Um, this was a video about uh, the two full moons in October being kind of special. And that was actually true for most of the world, but at some longitude, some time zones, the second full moon was actually in November. And I thought it was pretty cool that the same full moon can be on a different day of the year for different watchers. And that I thought of it ahead of time before I told the whole world on the World Wide Web that there are two full moons in October. Um, not putting the date in the title. Here's one um, 
about how to spot the Pleiades and it just shows how to follow Orion's belt to find them and how to use averted vision to uh, see as many of the stars as you can, challenges for the casual sky, sky watcher. Uh, the Pleiades are such a good one because they're findable and good for study, except I posted it in November when it was appropriate to look for the Pleiades. And then as the months go by, you can use the YouTube analytics to see how people are watching it. And um, even up to this week, there's someone watching it almost every day. And if they try to put into practice what I've told them to do, um, it's not there. So I go back to the video description and say, November is a good time to see the Pleiades. Um, I don't suppose a lot of people go to a video page and then read all the description. They go to the video page to watch. So I should have had it in the title and mentioned it in the video. So I recommend things that are date specific to, to let people know. Otherwise, your video is disconnected from their reality, at least for the time they might be watching it. Um, I used to do, you know, Jupiter, Saturn, and Mars will all be together, and the moon on this night will be with them. Um, another time when I should have added a date. Um, those are four of the pitfalls I thought of. Um, Probably lots I haven't thought of yet. How about you all? I guess some of them also could be if you're talking about a specific uh, planet or num naming moons and the next day uh, they discover four more moons, you have to <laughs> go back in and, uh, and edit. So uh, it's really great to see that things are constantly evolving in, in our in our science, but um, sometimes it's a little bit of a problem and you have to go back in or just say that as of today, this is the correct you know, number of moons or this is our thinking on how this galaxy evolved or whatever. But uh, I think that's the only thing that I see that you know, you're constantly updating your, uh, your, your little fact sheets. <laughs> uh-huh, well, I like the as of. Um strategy because it sort of highlights the fact that our knowledge is expanding. Yeah, yeah, I always kind of try to do that even in the live shows in the in the planetarium. I say, I say that, you know, as of right now, we know of this many, but actually I have visuals that say and counting when I'm talking about solar system objects. It just, you know, it'll have a list of, you know, asteroids, you know, 7, 700,000 asteroids and counting, you know, 200 moons and counting and so on. And it lets people know that, you know, this is a, not a fixed number and we're still discovering stuff about where we, where we live. I noticed there's one background that I left off my list in this Zoom setup I've got, um, but it goes back to some of the practices of making the videos and pitfalls at the beginning um, was saying, hello, I'm John from the Lawrence Hall of Science. We're working from home. And I've noticed this in a lot of other videos. Um, Hi, I'm so-and-so and I'm so-and-so and we're from, um, and if you look at the YouTube analytics during the first seven or eight seconds, the number of people who stick with your videos drops a lot. Usually I'm happy if there are more than 25% of the people at the end who started at the beginning. I think that's kind of typical. And then I'm really happy when it's more like a third of the people watch all the way to the end. But if you start, um, start saying, hi, this thing's happening and I'm gonna show you how to see it and then do it. And then let all, I'm John Erickson from the Lawrence Hall of Science be just in the label here. Um, so they don't have to listen to me say it. 
um, it makes a video that I like making better and the kind of video I like watching better. So getting right into it. I notice in a lot of the live programs that are pre-recorded, um, that get recorded and are posted for people to watch, there's a lot of front matter, partly because it's live and people are welcoming other people to watch and they're introducing all the people involved. Um, I can't see other people's YouTube analytics, so I don't know how many they lose during that part. Um, but I imagine it's pretty significant. Yes, yeah, so my, my pet peeve is some people will have like a, a you know, 20 second or 30 second music thing over their visuals to introduce the show. And it's like, you're right, just get right into it and, you know, spare me, you know, the romancing of, of your branding, you know? <laughs> mm -hmm. um, we have a little branding that's two seconds before they see me and this label telling them who I am. And I do try to get, you know, why are you watching this? Well, let's do it. So those are the things I thought of sharing about my video experience. Um, Alan, was there any chatter in the chat? Uh, no, uh, there is a com There is a couple of comments, uh, but no questions per se. Uh, I took off the spotlight right now. Um, so are you ready to go into like sort of a after after question? Pre-form discussion? Period? Yeah. Oh, one thing I thought might be nice, um, I wanted to watch more of other people's videos and I can't always find them. Maybe if you have something you think is a good example of what you've done that you want people to watch, you could put a link to that in the chat. And I should have gotten ready with a link of my own, but maybe I can do that now while we're all talking together. Yeah, you know, I have a, I have a, um, an observation when you were talking about Google Analytics and the the drop off of how many people actually watch it to the end that there's way more people who watch it at the beginning than that stay through to the end that is an obvious argument for making things short and so I'm still I'm still interested in what the ideal length of something is I know it probably depends on the topic but I think there's generally you know, there's probably sort of some general rule about how long something is if you want them to watch till the end. I think that's a hard one, Alan. If you look at like Derek Demeter has done star shows that, you know, go for hours and people stick with it so it, it i don't know maybe it's a difference in the, the way the audiences come to the video you know you might build up a following for certain programs but i, I know a lot of people agree that the shortest videos get the best amounts of audience or maybe it's a different audience that's less interested but you're hooking them just a little bit i i don't have a lot of experience with this i kind of rather rather do stuff in person so i've kind of kept my virtual uh interactions minimal but one thing as a viewer that's important to me as a person of a certain age with moderate hearing loss is sound quality and i'll find myself uh, if the sound quality is poor, it just takes so much more concentration. I get fatigued um, much more easily. So, um, yeah, I think use of a good microphone is is probably a good um, good idea. If especially if you're doing one a little bit longer. You know, one thing I appreciated about your. Um, 
you know, what you talked about, John, uh, you know, is the simplicity of your techniques. Um, I, you know, that you don't even use OBS, you know, you're, all you're using is Zoom with some backgrounds and doing some editing later. I, I that's just, that's impressive to me. I think it's for the quality of stuff that you've come up with. Um, you know, I wanted to call this no OBS, no problem. <laughs> uh, and mine's a work computer, so I can't download things myself onto it, and I can't go to work to have them download it. So again, it's a case of um, it would be inconvenient or impossible to use OBS unless I got a personal home computer, my, which eventually maybe I'll have to do. So now there's a question in the chat from Carol. She says, do you ever have sync problems, audio? Um, in the first few videos, I recorded some sequences on my iPhone and spliced them into the video with the other things that I recorded on Zoom. Then when we played them back on YouTube, the video, the audio before that got out of sync and actually speed up like you know, sounding like the chipmunks. Um, and so I stopped doing that, but that's the only example of my audio and video getting out of sync that I can think of. I actually remember that there, and it'd be, it'd be nice to know what the cause of that really is. If there's some editing trick that would prevent that. Yeah. Um, I would have loved to know that. <laughs> I wonder, you know, if I made the video I recorded on my iPhone a video background in Zoom and then <laughs> then recorded that in Zoom, it might have worked. So this isn't um, really, oh, sorry. Did you want to finish your thought? Well, I didn't say much about my favorite topics, hmm. partly because I'm a little mystified of what gets a lot of views and what doesn't. Um, you know, I found mostly stories about stars and star lore score low, um, hmm. but occasionally you get one that gets high. And for me, low means 50 and high means 300 with a few exceptions of um, some that take off and get a few thousand, or in the case of Jupiter and Saturn's conjunction, I got almost 30,000. Don't know how that happened. Um, but ones where I do star lore are low. Um, ones where it's something people have seen on the news are usually the best. The ones where I say, here are sky highlights for July or August, those are sort of in the middle. I bet that has a lot to do with Google search uh, parameters. You know what people they, you know, if it's been on the news, then people are going to do searches on that topic, and if yours starts to go up, then there is a viral factor that yeah. Google actually, you know, the you know they're they always, it always mystifies me what the, the algorithms are with these, with Google and with, with social media in general, actually, uh, that what causes something to go viral, you know, and that's not the coronavirus that we're talking about, but it's similar. <laughs> One practice I have, and I don't know if it makes a difference, is after I've posted a video, I go to a different computer and do a search for it, and then, um, click it so that I'm sort of alerting the algorithm that the video is there and at least one person has shown interest in it. Um, and I know there's something called Google bombing where you can automate your computer to do that so that your offering to the internet moves up in the search engines. I, I don't know how to do that and I'm not sure I'd do it if I knew how. Sounds like cheating to me.
And so I was thinking of something that you mentioned during Ellipse at one time, John, about how when the audience is walking into your dome, you like to have a visual up that causes them to have a discussion with people near them, something that sparked questions or comments. And I'm mm -hmm. wondering if you have ever thought of putting something like that at the very beginning of your video uh, and kind of hooking them at the, at the start and then segueing into it. Hmm. It's not really a one-to-one -one match because people don't come to a video and then wait for it to start. Yeah, I was just thinking um, it's interesting pendant, so they might they might not know what it is right away. Um, uh huh. Well, some, some, sort of, can... some sort of teaser, maybe you know, yeah. give them some suspense, and then that would give them cause to to sit through the whole thing because they'll find out about it later. Mm -hmm. I like that idea. That's what I'm thinking. The yeah. closest thing I can think of was the Mew Moon example I gave mm -hmm. to you, uh, you know, hi, we're going to, here's a beautiful moon. What does new moon mean to you? Um, and then I went on to three definitions, a slender crescent after the time you mm. can't see the moon is often called a new moon or any time you can't see the, new, the moon uh, because it's too closely aligned with the sun or the exact moment when the alignment is closer. Um, and, and then I gave examples of images of each of those and challenges for things to look for. So that was a case where I had a question. Hmm. Um, that one, let me get that. Um, that background, oh, I think I've, I moved my monitor so that I'd be looking at my camera when I'm looking at you all and now I'm not, <laughs> sorry. Uh, but choose my virtual background. That one about gravity, let's see if I can get that up. Where is that one about gravity? This is the advantage of pre-recording. There, that one. I originally threw the ball up and then I asked questions. Um, when does the force of my hand wear off? That's question one. Um, when does the force of gravity take over after the force for my hand wears off? That's question two. And then question three is, are these questions any good? Uh, uh, stop the video and talk about what you think about that. Yeah. And then I said, you know, in science, maybe there's no such things as a bad question, but those questions have real problems. And I give them some better questions. Do you ever get people contacting you after to, to talk to you about your videos? Um, once someone asked if they could put a link to it in their blog about scenic New England. <laughs> and I said, sure. <laughs> what was that one about? <laughs> uh, and then I looked to see if I got a lot more hits on that one. Um, it did okay. Would you uh, would you ever put? I'm sorry. Go ahead, uh, uh, John. Do they do people ask you uh, about um, different topics, wanting to do vi a video on some other astronomy topic than what you've done? Um, no, and I I originally asked people to, but I the mechanism for it had to be shut down. Um, I guess someone I used to work with emailed me saying, I saw your videos. Um, I even showed them with my class. 
And I said, oh, how nice. Um, you should ask your class if there are other topics you want a video about and didn't hear back from them, which means I still get to decide. Do you, uh, do you have a, a place in your own, in your museum or your planetarium where you can run the videos while people are waiting online? So uh, you kind of build in an audience there and they can look for, you know what I mean? You can just run them in a loop or something and then. Um, have... Yeah, we have a video screen outside our planetarium and we run the NASA view space, sort of a free mm -hmm. sequence of streaming videos from NASA, which is sort of the dreamy, spacey yeah. format, but really kind of engaging. And I say, that's what we have. Um, we're taking advantage of being closed to change everything around. And I've been in vacation for seven weeks. I'm not sure vacation is the right word since I'm technically retired. Um, uh, so I don't really know what the setup's going to be when I get back. That's a good idea, though. Um, that's a that's something to look into. Yeah, oh. instead of some external video, nice as it is from NASA, it might be nice to have some of our homegrown ones. If that were the case, I might take a little more pains with the video though. I do my four to six hours and I think that's pretty good. And generally I think it is pretty good, but there are always things I think if I'd spent more time could have been clearer or more polished. John, there's a, I have to, I wanna mention this that Rosemary put in the chat. I just wanted to say it out loud that she checked into Zoom I guess you did a search and th what Zoom says for playing a video, this is concerning audio. Zoom says for playing a video during a Zoom session, perhaps the recording of the Zoom would have less problems. I think that's in reference to the audio and she put a, a link in the chat about that. Yeah, I, I know that the first people who did Zooms would just play video on their own video player on their computer, but Zoom has a better way to do it. And I've not done it myself, but that's that's where the information is. So it's less choppy. Well, you can use videos as a background. Um, cases where I've done that is I wanted to show circumpolar stars. So I did a screen video of from Stellarium showing a full sky and we followed Cassiopeia around and I could trace it with my finger. Do you know if there's a, a size limit to that? I mean, it's if it's a background, is there? Are you limited to the length or the size of file? Um, I think all of that processing happens on your own computer, not over the internet. Hmm. So it would depend on your own computer's power. Th that's a guess. Well, we're coming up on the hour, uh, not that we oh. need to stop, but I wanted to remind if anybody came in late, could you uh, sign into the chat, put your name and where you're from? I think almost everybody has done that, but if you came in late, sign into the chat. And uh, we're not quite ready to end, but for anybody who needs to leave, um, I wanna formally and officially and wholeheartedly thank you, John. This has been a really, really, really good presentation. I. I enjoy it thoroughly. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, anyone who's got a similar thing, I like to compare and contrast, get hold of Alan and offer yourself as a presenter here. Here, here. One other thing that I've been thinking about um, adding just really briefly that we do in our um, like confirmation emails when people sign up for our live programs, but I think it would apply for videos too, is like 
is reminding them to make sure their screens are clean and that they're turned up as high as they can go, or like the screen brightness, I mean, um, because a lot of the like star fields and things, if they have a, like their screens are turned down really dim, uh, if they're on a laptop or, you know, whatever, if they're trying to save battery, then they're going to have a hard time seeing. So that was the only other thing that I thought I would add from some of our experiences. That reminds me of another pitfall. If you were to watch all my videos sometime last fall, you would have noticed them getting a little blurrier and a little blurrier, not the backgrounds, but me. Uh, the coding on my computer was degrading and right where the camera was, it wasn't good. And finally I did some heavy duty cleaning on it and then I got sharp again. Yeah, I was just going to comment that that guy behind you is very good looking, John. Oh, yeah. You know, when I look at him and I look at those questions and answers, I see them all backward. Um, that's another pitfall is it's backwards. Um, sometimes I've pointed out stars. Here's the summer triangle and Sagittarius should be down here. And it's not there because I've forgotten that it's mirrored and it's <laughs> really over there. So you see me presenting. I think there's a setting on Zoom where you can choose that now. I just saw that today where you can either choose it to be mirrored or not. You can unmirror it, but then I really get lost yeah. with where I'm pointing and where I think I'm pointing. So First I do better with the mirror. But when there's text that I'm going to read, I have to really practice ahead of time so that I'm not obviously trying to read something that's hard to read and it's only hard to read because I'm reading it mirror wise. Andy just said that's like the what weather weathermen weather people do. Oh and, yeah. Uh, that occurred to me earlier too that you, what you're doing is quite similar to what we see on the uh -huh. weather shows. But I really like this strategy because I can point to the text above me and do that and point here. Sometimes I do it over my shoulder as if I'm looking back, but in that case, I'm just looking at the green cloth. <laughs> now it's obvious that you're well practiced at this. Just having the second monitor there um, makes it easy. And once I did that, I haven't really explored other options because it works so elegantly. John, for your monthly special topics, how do you decide what you're going to make a video about? Like, do you already have a brainstorm list and you just pick one or um, something that's coming up that month? Sometimes I think ahead. Um, you know, I think I'm going to do the Perseid meteor shower in my uh, highlights for August rather than a special one because I did a special one last year and I just might include a link to the one I made last year. Um, I feel like it gets used up if I do it. Don't want to do it again. So I haven't decided for August. I haven't one done one specifically on Venus and Venus is just getting better and better and it will be for a few months. So that might be a good thing to ask them to investigate the progress of Venus in the evening. Make sure you get the date, the time, the dates when it's applicable. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so people who log in next year won't say, hey, he's can't be trusted. Venus wasn't out. Better practice what you preach. Uh, this is Rosemary. I have a question. Going back to your use of Stellarium, where you had like um, the planets on different days, um, 30 minutes after sunset. Um, I don't know how to do that with Stellarium. What did you do to overlap those to get the planets on there? Um, you don't do it in Stellarium. You take a whole lot of Stellarium shots and then Photoshop to take the bits you want and put them together. Okay. So, um, I did a screenshot for each for 10 different days in what it was that May. 
and then um, cut cut Venus out. And each one of those was a half hour after sunset. So not the same time each day, but I could have done the same time each day, I suppose. But then the sky would have been a different level of darkness as the month went by. So I did it half hour after sunset each day. I think we need to put that in as a feature request for uh, Stellarium. Um, Stellarium has probably got lots of features I haven't um, discovered yet. Maybe it does have that. Who knows? <laughs> does Nightshade have something like that? A stop action kind of thing? Oh, yeah. It's got a time lapse. So you can got do a time that. time lapse. Mm -hmm. So you can go, yeah, you could jump the sidereal day at a time. To Although you'd have to adjust if you wanted to stick with 30 minutes after sunset. That would get a little more complicated. But it, it could can be you done. Command, is there a command to go to sunset rather than a particular time? No, you'd have to have to know your local sunset yeah. time and set it to that. Well, that's what I did with Stellarium was mm. I I put it on the ocean horizon and oh, okay. then went to sunset. Yeah. And then, then yeah, took we the should, screenshot. We should I talk at some only, point. Mm -hmm. I needed only one screenshot with a interesting horizon and I did the rest with an ocean horizon yeah. so that I could see where the sun was really sense. setting. You see yeah, a green we... flash? <laughs> oh. <laughs> that would be cool. Um, yeah, there's some things we could talk about. I don't want to get all marketing on you, but, um, but we should talk about how nightshade might be easier, some of what you're doing. Oh. Ah. And I've got, Alan lent me his nightshade at home set up. Oh, cool. All right. And I had an idea for my, um, the little teaser, one little teaser thing. Um, one of your Zoom backgrounds was uh, the Jupiter Saturn um, summer triangle. Uh -huh. I'm remembering that right. So as your teaser, when you're first saying hello to everybody in your video, um, it might need some tweaks to make it bigger. But I was thinking, you know, what if you didn't have the labels on and you just say, what are all these bright dots? Or, you know, something like that. You open it. What are all these bright dots? Um, come up with something more exciting than what I just said. But uh, let's find out what's your planets, what's your stars. You know, there's all sorts of ways that you could go from there. Uh-huh. Well, if I were going to do the planet star thing, which would be a great video, I would, I think I did this with Mars once. I, I did weekly shots of the same thing and watched one of the little red things move. Uh, this is Rosemary again, I'll ask. Um, so did you try OBS and decide it was just, no, oh, I remember you said now, because you're working at home, you yeah, were not allowed it, um, to install and download. Yeah. Yeah, I need an administrator's password. Right. Yeah. I'm not allowed to know what that is. <laughs> okay. I really like the simple approach. It doesn't have to I be do complicated too, so to be I, done well. Yeah. I haven't pursued any changes. Mm -hmm. That's sort of why I want to watch other people so I can say, how do they do that? Yeah. You have some interesting northern lights going on over there. I think it's just That's your green screen around. Yeah, the sun is coming <laughs> through the window and shining on my green screen. That was fun. Oh, did I did I miss this? Oh, I missed a slide. Golly, one of my favorite. Uh, only once did I show my green screen on Zoom. Um, I said, you know, I'm going to turn off my green screen and put on this green sweater and a gray sock on my hand. And this was to just um, 
we've been looking at the dark parts and the bright parts on the moon, but actually all the parts are pretty dark. Um, but when a dark thing is against a black background and you shine a light on it, um, here's me with a flashlight shining a light on my hand, on my gray sock, uh -huh. suddenly it looks bright. So um, that shows how a charcoal gray lump of rock in the sky can seem not like a charcoal gray lump of rock. That's excellent. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I didn't really have to put on the green sweatshirt to do it, but it was more fun that way. <laughs> and another way I have fun is involving my cat in the videos. Well, it's well known that everyone loves cat videos. Mm -hmm. What's the cat's Aww. name? The cat's name is Miles. So here's Miles as a substitute for Leo. <laughs> um, my very first video, I recorded it uh, with no background, just <laughs> saying, you know, we're gonna do videos now because we can't go to the museum. And it seemed almost unwatchable. So I thought, what can I do to make it better? And um, I thought, well, I'll hold my cat. Um, here I'm wearing the green sweatshirt holding the cat. Um, I was doing one about halos and ice crystals. That's one of my favorites. And uh, I had a little cardboard hexagon as an ice crystal and my cat comes in and attacks it because it's like a cat toy. And here I'm comparing the cat to Mars and how it would be a good environment for a cat who wants to be camouflaged. So maybe that's a good finale. Uh, okay, that's my cue to, uh, I'd like to do an experiment here, uh, uh, if I may. Request that everybody unmute. If you find your mute button, unmute. And let's see what a round of applause sounds like uh, if everybody is unmuted. That was great. Thanks a lot, John. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you all for showing up and sticking with us. And, and I think uh, that's, that's three of us in present company who have or have had cats named Miles, me, mm -hmm. John, and Carrie. Yep. Anybody else? Amazing. Good cat name. Yeah. <laughs> Ours got it because he runs a lot. He runs for miles. <laughs> so just as a last announcement uh, before I sh shut off the recording, um, the we do have a sort of a late uh, late breaking addition to as an August um, mm. an August planetarians Zoom seminar. That's going to be at the end of August, so it shouldn't enter. You you should be ready to come to this uh, after. Of course, there's WAC next week, the Western Alliance Conference. So I hope you all know about that. Go to the WAC website. Maybe I should put that in the chat. Um, and then there's of course the IPS conference, which is happening the week after that. But then you have a whole week or two where where nothing is happening. You're not going to be doing anything. And then there's another Planetarians web seminar, which will be Jeff Nee from JPL is going to he, he wanted to do a tutorial or a training session on um, Blender, how to make uh, animations with Blender. And that's something I would be looking forward to a lot. And do you need a Windows computer for that? No, I think it. I think you can do it on a Mac. Okay. And I'm going to stop the recording now.